Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, in the past year, the three largest banks in this country, J.P. Morgan, Chase, Citigroup, and Bank of America, have admitted to breaking the law and have settled with the government for a combined $35 billion. Now, as Judge Rakoff of the Southern District of New York has noted, the law on this is clear. No corporation can break the law unless an individual within that corporation broke the law. Yet, despite the misconduct of these banks that generated tens of billions of dollars in settlement payments by the companies, not a single senior executive at these banks has been criminally prosecuted. Now, I know that your agencies can't bring prosecutions directly, but you are supposed to refer cases to the Justice Department when you think individuals should be prosecuted. So can you tell me how many senior executives at these three banks you have referred to the Justice Department for prosecution? Well, Senator, I don't know the answer to that question, but I want to pick up on something you just said because I think it's actually quite important, that although failures of the sort that have resulted in these big fines, criminal and civil, almost always result from problems in organizations because there are many ways to catch them. Governor Terula, I'm sorry. Hold on, Senator, if I could. There often are individuals who can clearly be identified as responsible, and although, as you know, we don't have criminal prosecutorial power, what we do have is the power to insist that firms either discharge current employees who have been implicated in this, even if they haven't been criminally prosecuted, which we've done in the past couple of cases, or, as we are doing now, conducting investigations under the authorities that are already in the law that would allow us to ban these people from working for anyone. So I take it what you're saying, Governor Terula, is that you don't know of any criminal prosecutions in these three banks that the Fed has recommended. You have investigated enough to know that these banks are responsible. They have admitted to wrongdoing. They have signed up for $35 billion in a settlement, and no one has been referred? Well, Senator, we've shared all the information that the Department of Justice needed, and I think the Justice Department has probably made its own assessment on both sets of criminal and civil approaches. So you're saying you have referred people for criminal prosecution? No, we have provided information. But you have not actually referred someone for criminal prosecution. You know, I just want to be clear about the contrast here. After the savings and loan crisis in the 1970s and the 1980s, the government brought over 1,000 criminal prosecutions and got over 800 convictions. The FBI opened nearly 5,500 criminal investigations because of referrals from banking investigators and regulators. So if we didn't even limit it to these three banks, how many prosecutions have you all regulated? You know, what we have to remember here is the main reason that we punish illegal behavior is for deterrence, you know, to make sure that the next banker who's thinking about breaking the law remembers that a guy down the hall was hauled out of here in handcuffs when he did that. These civil settlements don't provide deterrence. The shareholders for the companies pay the settlement. Senior management doesn't pay a dime. And, in fact, if you're like Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, you might even get an $8.5 million raise for the settlement of negotiating such a great settlement when your company breaks the law. So without criminal prosecutions, the message to every Wall Street banker is loud and clear. If you break the law, you are not going to jail, but you might end up with a much bigger paycheck. So no one should be above the law. If you steal $100 on Main Street, you're probably going to jail. If you steal a billion bucks on Wall Street, you darn well better go to jail, too. So I have another question I want to ask about, and that is about living wills. That is, the plans that big banks are supposed to submit now so that if they start to fail, they could be liquidated without bringing down the economy or needing a taxpayer bailout. 
Last month, the FDIC and the Fed, as we talked about earlier, um, sent a le letters to 11 of the country's biggest banks telling them that their living wills didn't cut it. You said that if these banks failed, either they would need a government bailout or they would bring down the economy. These letters confirmed quite literally that six years after the financial crisis, all of our biggest banks remain too big to fail. Now, in your joint statement, you said, and I want to get this right, that by next July, the 11 banks must demonstrate, quote, significant progress to address all the shortcomings identified in the letter. And if the banks don't address significant progress, you told Senator Corker earlier in this hearing, you have tools to force the banks to make changes. And I just want to underline, that means higher capital standards, higher liquidity standards, restrict bank growth, limit bank operations. But these actions take place only if there's not significant progress on the part of the banks. So I just would like the two of you, FDIC and the Fed, just to speak briefly to the question, because I realize I'm out of time here, Mr. Chairman. What constitutes significant in this case? What is it you want to see the too-big-to-fail banks do? And if they don't do it, the action you're going to take. Chairman Greenberg, maybe we could start with you and then Governor Tarullo. Uh, Senator, uh, we laid out in these letters a pretty specific set of markers for the institutions to meet that I think goes to really some of the key obstacles to uh, orderly resolution of these firms. We directed them in the letters to simplify their legal structures so that they put their business lines in line with their legal entities so that in resolution you can sort the firm out and figure out how to manage the failure. Um, critical issue is their derivative contracts. Those contracts provide uh, for automatic termination in the event of the beginning of an insolvency proceeding. Those contracts need to be changed in order to avoid the contagion consequences that we saw in 2008 from a disorderly termination of those contracts. We direct in the letters the firms to change those contracts. Critical operations. A firm has got to be able during the course of a resolution process to maintain its IT and other critical operations so the whole operation doesn't fall apart. You may have an IT uh, operation in a foreign jurisdiction that could get taken out or uh, not made available as a result of problems by the institution. The institution has to develop backup capabilities to sustain its critical operations. Otherwise, the public ends up having to, to pick up uh, the, uh, the slack information. The institutions have to be able to produce critical, timely information that's essential to managing uh, a resolution process. The firms right now don't have that capability. So these are specific, measurable actions that we've directed the firms to take. And I think we're going to be looking for these firms to take specific, measurable actions to address these. And they've got a year now. They're on notice. I think we're going to be working closely with these firms so there's clarity of guidance, and we're going to be expecting action. And that's that's really the, the whole purpose of, of this effort. Yeah, if I could just under, you, underscore that last point that Marty made, Senator. Um, that we, none of us wants to be in the situation where next July or August there's the situation, well, we've made this progress. Is this significant or is this not? Right. And so what Marty just alluded to is the point I was going to make, and I will now underscore, that we have our supervisors from the Fed and the FDIC in the institutions right now, and this will be a process of what are you going to do about this and wanting to hear in very tangible terms what it is they're doing. And I know at the Fed, I suspect at the FDIC, the boards will be regularly briefed on this so that we'll be in a position to be giving indications that this is what we expected, or you guys are already falling short. Because uh, I think what lay behind your question was a concern that next July we get into this palaver of whether progress has been significant. So we're not going to be back here a year from now having the same conversation again. You're prepared to demand that they take these measurable steps, and if they fail to do so, you're going to use your tools to take them for them. Correct. Is that right? Good. Thank you. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman.
Senator Shelby. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to follow up on uh, Senator Warren's uh, observations regarding the Justice Department uh, and criminal activity and financial institutions or whatever. Uh, I realize that you're regular. You're not prosecuted. But if there's $35 billion more or less in fines and settlements because of criminal conduct, and there's no justice, justice is important for the big and the well-being and also small. Something's wrong with the Justice Department. And people shouldn't be able, whoever they are, not just financial institutions, should be able to buy their way out of for culpability, especially when it's so strong it defies rationality. You know, I, I agree with her on that. But I, I think, uh, Senator Warren, that it goes to the Justice Department because I'm not defending our regulators because I'm calling the task at time. But they can make recommendations. They can send things over. But ultimately, it seems like the Justice Department seems bent on money rather than justice. You know, and that's a mistake. And the American people pick up on that. Having said that, Governor, I want to get back on the insurance regulation, if I could. Have, have you or others 